Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Helena Basil Morozo, a cultural philosopher, a writer and lecturer in media and communication at Glasgow Caledonian University. She's interested in ways in which we interact with our society and particularly how our identities are shaped by our environment. Her books include Tim Burton, The Monster and the Crowd, The Trickster in Contemporary Film and her latest book which has co-written with Luke Hockley and comes out in December is entitled Jungian Film Studies, The Essential Guide and this is going to be the topic of our discussion today. Hello Helena, welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you, hello Barry. Okay, well could you begin Helena by telling us maybe a bit about yourself and how you became interested in this field of work and maybe Jung in general? Uh, I first became interested in Jung as a PhD student, which was 15, 16 years ago when I was writing a dissertation about John Fowles, who is out of fashion, unfortunately, at the moment. But his, his novels are quite archetypal. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was himself uh, interested in Jung and influenced by Jung. So I had to use Jung yeah. because, of, because many of his narratives are actually structured in a very Jungian way. And then I realized that I would love to do this with film as well, uh, particularly because uh, Christopher Vogler's book was becoming more and more popular. And this is a book of a Hollywood doctor, kind of script writing uh, doctor who uses Jung to write perfect Hollywood narratives that would sell. And so I realized that Jung is extremely applicable to film studies and to filmmaking and yep. to script writing as well. And so since then, I've been writing books about Jung and, and film studies or application of Jungian theory to film studies. OK, well, well let's, let's just dive straight in then. So to get a general understanding of film studies, how, how has it generally been organized up, up to now? It's quite, uh, I'd say Jungian film studies became prominent in the 21st century because uh, Jungian scholars before the 21st century weren't really interested in film studies. Again, that's Vogler's book that made people more interested in in, um, applying Jung to film studies. Um, I'd say there are two schools in general two types of Jungian film scholars. One is myself and Terry Waddell and Katrina Miller, for instance, who write about more about archetypes in narratives because we, we try to apply. I, for instance, I teach creative writing students. I teach uh, screenwriting students. So I need Jung to actually teach them how to use archetypes and the individuation process in narratives. And the second school is more interested in how meaning is created in the audience, how the audience perceives narratives and how they draw meaning out of the narratives. The, the Jungian phenomenological school, so to say, that's Luke Hockley, that's Greg Singh, for instance, they're more interested in the meaning making process. And all, obviously there's Chris Hawk, who is also a filmmaker and he's interested in both how narratives influence people, how people make meaning um, out of these narratives, how they relate to the narratives, and that also inter- he's also interested in the structure of the narratives and how you as a filmmaker or a scriptwriter or a creative person, how, how you can use Jung to practically structure your film or your book. Okay, and how did this, you say this is very much a 21st century phenomenon, uh, were there any factors that caused this shift or this, this interest? I would say it was a, a matter of, I'd say Campbell and Vogler became uh, extremely popular. Then you had George Lucas, who was, who still is a big fan of Joseph Campbell. So he started using Jung. Vogler became very influential. 
and it, I thought I just thought it was a shame to actually let people use Jungian theory without any academic involvement. Yeah. So you have lay people, you've got writers using Jung, but no academic involvement. And what began to happen was quite a strange process. People uh, mm -hmm. using Jungian theory who were not academics, but quite imprecise. Uh, they, they, they confused Jung and Freud and Campbell and it became a mishmash. Vogel in particular uh, doesn't really, he's not interested in being precise or academically precise or the details, he wants the overall picture. I, I thought it's a shame we have to get involved somehow. We just can't you know, keep the academic school separately from the practical school. It doesn't work like this. And Luke Cockley is also a therapist, so he uses Jungian film studies in his, you know, in his own private practice. He recommends films to his patients, for instance. And as far as I know, quite a few therapists do this as well, not just film therapists, but also as part of their practice. Okay. Well, just for the uninitiated listener, Helena, uh, could you maybe give us a bit of an overview of what Jungian Film Studies is and, and what it can offer? Uh, it can offer many, many things. First of all, I am particularly interested in the practical application of, applications of Jungian Film Studies. And therapists are also interested in the practical applications of Jungian Film Studies. Unlike, I would say, Lacanian and Freudian theory, which is extremely complex and theoretical, Jung is much more user-friendly. It takes me maybe a couple of lectures to uh, introduce students to Jung who have never read a book by Jung or know nothing about Jungian theory. So I am interested in how I can use Jung to teach people to write or to draw, to use Jung uh, for creativity, for the purposes of creating something. Therapists are interested in Jungian film studies, particularly because they can use films as a mirror for their clients to learn about themselves. Uh, kind of it's a self-development, self-discovery process because films are, they are fantastic mirrors that can initiate this self-healing and self-understanding process. And um, there are many, many uses for, for Jungian film theory. I'd say self-development and uh, writing and painting are the main uses. Smashing. Oh, well, maybe we can unpack that a little bit further as we go along. But what would you say are its main areas of concern? All the main areas, main areas of concern. The first one is we've had many years of Lacanian, Lacanian film theory and Freudian, post-Freudian film theory, which, as I have mentioned already, is extremely complex. You have the linguistic and the imaginary, etc., etc., and the social order and the name of the father. And it is very theoretical, but if you take this theory, you could not write out of it. You cannot really write a film using this extremely heavy body of theory. And film is a very visual thing. And it's it's all about images, visual images, not maybe using them as signs, but using them as symbols which can be amplified. And Lacanian and Freudian theory is very word orientated. It's all about analyzing everything, explaining everything away in many in many ways. So I would say our first concern is to take film theory, the academic film theory, away from Lacan and from Freud and to actually somehow move it towards its practical, direct practical application. Because if you think about it, the individuation theory, it's all about the narrative. It's all about how we see ourselves as a story, as, as the protagonist of the story, and, and films and books are about the same, more or less. So this, is, this is our first concern, I would say. Sure. What would you say are the pitfalls that, uh, to avoid with uh, Jungian film studies? It's the age-old sign versus symbol process. So signs are... Uh, interpreted literally. So you have a cave and you see it as a vagina, for instance, which cannot, in, in Jungian 
in the Jungian world, you can't do this. You have it's a symbol. You have to have respect for this symbol because that's the language in which the unconscious speaks. And the unconscious doesn't mean you to interpret these symbols literally. It has to. You have to have respect for them. You have to give it a range of interpretations, a range of different visions. It can be this or that or something else, or maybe it's nothing. At this stage, it doesn't mean anything. You have to kind of think about it as a, a whole range of experiences and symbols rather than just one one meaning. It's many, many different meanings. So would you say that Jungian film studies has a, a more provisional, synthetic sensibility to it than the Lacanian or Freudian? It is. I would say it has more respect for the symbol, much more respect for the symbol. The film doesn't mean just it doesn't have just one interpretation. It has or has the potential to have many different interpretations because we're all unique individuals. And that's where the phenomenological wing of the Jungian film study steps in because meaning is extremely subjective. Meaning is personal. It is created for you individually. If you see a symbol in the film, it doesn't mean just this. You can't say that this is a trickster and nothing else. This is, that may not be a trickster, or maybe a hero or something else. And in fact, if you think about Jungian archetypes, they're never precise. They can mix and match and they can mingle. And there are quite a few kind of cross pollination and intersections and that they don't have really don't have much clarity in them. In fact, the those Lacanians who are in the field of film studies, that's what they don't like about Jungian theory so far. It's not precise. So you're saying that there's this recognition that any meaningful symbol, uh, whether it be in film or poetry or whatever, is inevitably an interaction um, between the, the, the participant, the person who's engaging with it, and the, and the symbol itself. Absolutely. So this, this is your personal narrative. You, you see this generalised very loose narrative on screen, but what it means, it only means it for you. It doesn't mean the same for the whole audience. Sure. Um, just back to the book then for, for a minute ago. How did you actually go about structuring the book and, and what was your rationale behind that? Uh, we wrote separately, myself and my co-writer, Luke Hockley, Professor Luke Hockley from the University of Bedfordshire. I covered three or four chapters, he covered the rest of the chapters as well. So he mainly dealt with his idea of the third image uh, of the meaning making processes behind the, the the watching of the film, the process of, of film watching as well. And I mainly dealt with the structural elements, the, the archetypes, how they work in narratives, the individuation process, how it works in narratives. But I also, and that's quite important, I also covered the uh, the feminist vision of Jungian film studies. And out of the chapter, I wrote a, a separate chapter on feminism and Jungian film studies, in which obviously I criticised Jung and, and some of his disciples for being quite sexist and uh, quite limited in their view of the individuating female which coincides with the filmmaking uh, tradition of the time. The, the female is not the quester. The female is not the hero. The female is the one who's uh, waiting for the male hero at home. She's the wife, she's the daughter, she's the, the beautiful maiden waiting to, to be rescued. And right now, and Vogel maybe played a big part in this process as well, right now we're seeing more and more female protagonists it would be nice to have, explore that a bit later on in the talk when we talk about films and television serials themselves. But uh, just back to um, something that maybe relate to it earlier a bit of when we were talking about meaning. Jung didn't shy away from the inexplicable, the irrational and the mysterious. How much is this reflected in, the, uh, in Jungian film studies? What I'm trying to do, that's a very difficult question for me because I'm trying to do two things. On the one hand, I'm trying to give the unconscious as much respect as, as Jung himself gave it. So the symbols are not signs. It, they have a number of interpretations. The language in which the unconscious speaks is never going to be precise. Hence the kind of the mystic, 
the mystical character of some of these interpretations. Uh, on the other hand, I am trying to make Jung user-friendly, and particularly I am trying to introduce Jung to Lacanians and Freudians who are pseudo-scientific. So you have to make Jung maybe a little bit more structured, a little less um, a mystic, a less of a mystic as well. So I am trying to do these two things simultaneously, and it is not easy, I can tell you. <laughs> Try to find a middle way there. Uh, Absolutely, <laughs> it is. It's very, very difficult, really. Sometimes I have to hide certain aspects of, of Jung. I want to, for instance, go to a, a film conference just to make sure that people don't, they don't get put off by Jungian <laughs> theory. Well, um, is there any knowledge about what Jung himself saw in film? Because he, um, he placed the, he appeared to place the visual above the linguistic. It's interesting, he didn't really, I think he mentioned cinema maybe a couple of times in his writings, but he didn't write at length about film, which is surprising because he writes at length about, obviously, uh, uh, Jewish's Ulysses, he writes about paintings at length, he writes obsessively about, you know, writers, musicians, Goethe, etc., etc., but he doesn't write about cinema and film, which is really strange. However, in some of his uh, collections, I think, oh, I'm looking here at uh, Men and His Symbols, yeah. um, his disciples do mention Charlie Chaplin, they do in relation to the trickster, they do mention contemporary films, maybe not Jung himself, but uh, Joseph Henderson and um, Marie-Louise von Franz, they do mention cinematic narratives on a regular basis, but maybe not Jung himself. However, he was interested in the creative process and in this kind of visual, symbolic side of the creative process. Okay. Um, we were talking earlier a little bit about meaning, and um, it's obviously an important aspect of Jungian film studies, exploring meaning, and perhaps the distinction between meaning and belief, and the role in arts in general, how, how that can play out in this regard. Now, for example, Jung famously said, I don't believe in God, but I know him. I mean, similarly, I, you know, I don't believe in Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader, but I nevertheless find their stories meaningful, just like I don't believe in fairies, but I can find the moral value very meaningful in fairy stories. Um, is this something also explored in Jungian film studies? Definitely, definitely, because in this day and age you've got these kind of new religions. If Obviously you mentioned Luke Skywalker and yeah. Star Wars. This has become a religion yeah. in many ways, particularly because Lucas was basing himself on Campbell. Campbell was basing himself on on Jung as well. So you you got this religious structure and the individuation process and uh, kind of all the um, difficulties on the on the, on hero's path as well. So you have to. It's 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 an interesting question. You have to deal again with uh, the power of cinema to create beliefs on the one hand and on the other hand with the fact that all beliefs that you see on screen, all images on symbols are your your own symbols. They may not be the same for other people as well. So you have this kind of two tier structure of your own level, your own meaning and then more general kind of mass meaning as well. Sure. Okay, can we have a look at some films or TV series? to see how they can be interpreted from a Jungian perspective. Maybe we could start with Tim Burton, who I know that you um, you have a particular interest in. I am, that was my first book, in fact, I became interested in the figure, in the archetype of the child, how Burton uses the child archetype in his, in his films, because I realised that all of his films are about the child, and the child in his films takes different guises. Sometimes the child can be just a child, a happy child who lost his father, or you can have a creative person, such as, for instance, Ed Wood, filmmaker in one of his films, or Edward Scissorhands, who is also a child, but already maybe a teenager. Then you have the child who is a monster. Then you have the child who is a hero, but he's still quite childish and immature in his own kind of head. Or the heroine, if you think about Alice in Wonderland, 
that's when for the, he for the first time employed a female protagonist, again being influenced by the changes in contemporary um, film and television uh, kind of influences and changes that are happening in, in narratives in film and TV uh, right now. Uh, does Tim Burton recognise that he's using this archetype? Very, very vaguely. He's not. He's very Jungian in this sense. He's. He doesn't really. He cannot speak properly. <laughs> he. He just. He uh, kind of gesticulates a lot. He mumbles a lot. He. He cannot explain. He sees it. He sees it, and he often because he doesn't write his own films. He describes them or he storyboards them, and he shows them to people who can write. And then they can write them up. So in this sense, he's absolutely, absolutely Jungian. And Batman is this, for Burton again, is the child who grew up to be a hero because his father died. If we go back to this Jungian archetype of the child, the child is special, the child is the future and the past. The child is special because his parents either disappeared or they, or they died or some, something something had, uh, happened or they neglected him, something happened to them. So that's how Burton explains the hero. The hero is this special person with these special superpowers because he used to be a special child and this specialness is there because he is a wounded person, because he's got problems, issues with his parents. But this is a very kind of basic level. And he goes up to the level of modernity and he talks about the hero of modernity who fights not just with the evil joker, whoever, enemies who killed his parents, but also with ecological issues, also with this urban alienation, the psychological fragmentation, all the issues that concern the contemporary individual and post-modernity he fights, the, the hero fights with them, the hero tries to overcome them um, on this higher level, together with the with other people, kind of for the sake of mankind, so to say, so he's a saviour in this sense. And then just for the, the average viewer going in to see one of these films, having a certain knowledge of how these, these things pan out from a Jungian perspective, how can that be helpful in, for just the the person in the cinema interpreting the film? Um, it can be useful in several ways, as it is usually with film. On the personal way, you can relate to the film, you can use the film for kind of projective, interjective exchange as a mirror of your own personal issues, and that's, that's what is being used in therapy. On higher levels, you can use the film to analyze the problems in your society or see the problems in your society. Because Jungian, uh, far from what Freudians and Lacanians think Jungian film studies and Jungian theory in general does concern the issues of modernity, it does concern ecology, it does concern politics, it does concern social issues. It's not just a simplistic fairy tale structure. And that's what Burton's film show to a large extent. They look like fairy tales, yeah. but what they discuss is the brokenness of contemporary life and how alienated we feel when we're separated from each other in this angular architecture of contemporary cities, for instance. We are not really, we're not together. There's no community as such left. We are broken inside because we don't relate to other people. That's what he discusses in his films. Interesting. Okay, and another archetype that you've explored in great detail in several of your books is the trickster. Can you think of a couple of examples maybe that illustrate that? The best example is probably uh, Jim Carrey's The Mask. Uh, oh, yeah. You have this kind of green based creature who is contemporary and saying uh, you have a, a very boring man who works in a bank, he's got a very boring life, no one likes him, he's in love with a beautiful lady but obviously she's too posh and, and too beautiful to be with him and he doesn't know how to escape from his boring life and, and escape himself in, in this sense and then he finds this mask and the green creature jumps out of the mask and turns him into someone that he didn't know was in him. 
into something else and someone else and he takes on a, a gang of gangsters and ma ma mafiosi people and then he by the end of the film he's a changed person he gets the beautiful woman and the mask leaves him the trickster goes away because the task of the trickster was to transform the individual and throughout the film the individual is being transformed via this mess via this chaos by, by being out of control completely and utterly and by the end of the narrative the trickster leaves leaves the narrative and leaves the protagonist and the protagonist uh, kind of pulls himself together and becomes a different person. It's fascinating and then you also talk about the process of individuation could you think of a couple of examples that really highlight that in film? Um, I, we can discuss it using the, the trickster archetype again okay. And it works. It works on so many different levels. It does work on the personal level. In all these trickster films, if you think about the lighter versions, it's obviously Jim Carrey. He he does play tricksters on a regular basis. If you think about the darker, more shadowy versions of the trickster, it's uh, Jack Nicholson, a Joker type of tricksters. Kind of on the scale from the lighter trickster to the darker tricksters, they are the two extremes. And yeah. Obviously, there will be lots of shades in between as well. The trickster is a big part of the individuation process in narratives because all the trickster films follow the same uh, kind of trajectory. You have the protagonist being stuck, the protagonist not knowing where to go. Then five minutes into the film, the trickster arrives, turns the protagonist's life upside down. The protagonist is in the liminal state, being out of control, going through this re almost ritualistic process throughout the film. And at the end of the film, the trickster has to disappear, die, or they don't really die. You know, usually they dissolved somehow, or they promise to come back when the protagonist is in trouble again, or the protagonist needs more chaos in his or her life. And then they having destroyed the system, the system being either the protagonist's own mindset or the oppressed people around the protagonist or the workplace or any or the government or any other system that stops the individual from individuating and becoming himself or herself, then the trickster can disappear. So the trickster is this trigger in the individuation process, this dynamic element that arrives every time the protagonist is stuck on the on the individuation path. And you can interpret the same on a high level again. Why is the trickster film so popular now? Why, why do you have so many comedies with tricksters? It's because the contemporary individual is in many, we are, we are free people in the West, we've got freedom, but it doesn't mean that we're free from systemic influence, we're free from systems. There are, there are many different systems that restrain us and control us and stop us from becoming ourselves in many ways. And we yeah. feel it. So we dream all this, we dream them up, we watch these comedies in which systems are challenged or changed or destroyed because we, we recognize ourselves in these protagonists. Okay. And let's just move on now to that chapter of on feminism. There were some um, very interesting films like Kill Bill and also some examples of the Nordic noir like The Killing and, and The Bridge. And I also mentioned Orange is the New Black with oh, yeah. which is the yeah. new Netflix. Have you seen it? Yeah. It's, I've, it's yeah. amazing. And Netflix is particularly interesting because it's not your Hollywood kind of mega structure, which is very slow to accept change. Hollywood is very, very conservative in this sense. Male protagonists work, so they keep a kind of producing male protagonists. Female protagonists, they're not so sure, but it's it's a gra gradually, if you think about Ghostbusters, for instance, gradually the change really trickles into Hollywood as well. Uh, we are also, myself and my colleague Katrina Miller from GCU, who just uh, who's a few office, uh, officers um, away. We're writing a book uh, about the female protagonist now, again for outreach, co-writing it, um, in which we trace how the prote female protagonists changed from throughout the history of the cinema. There, there were very, very few of them throughout the history of the cinema, 
and they emerged maybe in the past 20 to 30 years, and this emergence was very, very gradual. Very, if you think about Thelma and Louise, for instance. So, and the first female protagonists were more or less victims trying to break out of this oppressive world in which they were uh, kind of placed and expected to be a certain person yeah. and expected to conform to certain roles, for instance. In the past couple of years, we've got lots of f female fighters, uh, females expressing aggression and not being punished for it. If you think about Orange is the New Black, it's absolutely shocking in this sense. Women in Orange is the New Black do things that women, female protagonists or characters ne have never done on television. They're yeah. being disgusting, cruel, they're murderous, and at the same time they're still human beings, they're not objectified. Yeah. So yeah. this this is an old Jessica Jones, who again is another protagonist from the Netflix series. Um, she's a comic book character and she's fine with being single, with being sexually aggressive and with being not nice to men as well. Yeah, have you seen this latest series on BBC, uh, Fleabag? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That I was I was thinking about Fleabag as well in this sense. She's allowed to be allowed to be obsessed with sex and disgusting yeah. woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nice to see this complexity starting to come out rather than the, just these cardboard cutouts of women you often see. Of clean, pretty, nice smelling women, yeah. suddenly women can are allowed to be dishevelled and not yeah. nice. Or if they are the protagonist, then they, they, they sort of, they're almost default men. Like um, I'm thinking of maybe um, Terminator, and it's a slow process, but maybe it's maybe things like Orange is the New Black are, are really uh, encouraging people to break new ground. I would even think in maybe Fleabag wouldn't have been possible without Oranges and New Black. Yeah. It's yeah. difficult to be a, a, a pioneer, you know, you, you'd be scared to think, what if I introduce a woman who's obsessed with sex and propositions to men on a regular basis, what would people think? Maybe they will not watch <laughs> any of these yeah. things. Yeah. No, inter very interesting. Okay, we, we're coming to the, uh, the end now. Um, uh, Helena, but uh, I always ask people this question at the end of the, the talk. What is your understanding of the middle way, if any, Helena, and how, how, how might that relate to Jungian film studies? I would say it relates a lot to Jungian film studies because even as a writer, as I've already mentioned, you have to, on the one hand, try to keep, to be true to Jungian theory, and on the other hand, to not just care the, the academics, the, the film studies academics, for instance, so it does relate. And then in terms of um, teaching students, uh, creative writing, screenwriting students, on the one hand, you have to introduce them to Jungian theory, which, which is quite complex, involves a lot of uh, terminology. And on the other hand, you don't want to overcomplicate it because they're not academics, they're actually writers. It has to be practical rather than theoretical for them. So you always have to strike some kind of balance between the two things. It's not possible to just have one way of doing things. You always have to have a balance. Okay, great. Um, and it, my last question, if, if people wanted to, to find out more about your work, Helena, how would they go about it? Uh, the best thing would be to Google, and I have my own personal page with all the books and all the information about my projects. Um, and my email is there as well, my email address. So if someone wants to get in touch, you're most welcome. It's, it's, a, it's a public email. Okay, well, I, I'll, I'll put that up on the, the YouTube slideshow and I'll also link it on the page that I, when I publish this. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today, Helena. It's been, it's been really interesting. Thank, thank you for having me on the programme. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.com dot org